on that note, I think I might start. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the ACT, ACG branch would like to welcome you and particularly welcome Dr. Steph McClellan and Dr. John Clark, both of them currently working at Geosites Australia. And we're talking about working in isolation uh, on Antarctica and Mars. This is gonna be an exciting talk and I think really relevant for a wide range of people. Really, really grateful that Steph and John could join us at such short notice. Uh, one of the first things I'd like to do is thank our corporate members. These people help support the ACG uh, financially um, and they're also awesome partners to work with. Um, we'd also like to thank our branch sponsors. Um, you won't see an ACT branch sponsor here. Uh, Geosites Australia does um, put a lot of, um, not necessarily money, but um, effort into supporting the ACT branch. Um, so the Geoscience Australia should have a little logo here today, but um, we've got a lot of our branches get a lot of support from um, companies at the moment. I'd like to draw your attention to under these current circumstances, a lot of these companies are struggling. So uh, reach out to them if you've got any work and, and get them on your books um, yeah. early next year. Sorry, Marina, when, just to, yep. to um, can you start sharing your screen? I think that um, we're not seeing the ah. PowerPoint. Well done. Okay, I will find out how to do that. I think that happened when, um, all right, let me see. Sorry. Okay, let's go back to there. Um, let's go. Um, Is that better? Yep, that looks great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So sliding through our corporate uh, members again, uh, great uh, supporters of uh, the ACG in particular preview. Our branch sponsors, which I'll not linger on a little bit longer. Um, uh, again, Geoscience Australia helps uh, the ACT branch out quite a lot. Uh, and um, here are some of the other states and territories that get a lot of support, financial and otherwise, uh, work experience, mentoring, all, all sorts of support for their members in different states. Some of these are doing a little bit tough at the moment with the lack of field work that's uh, going on, but we expect it to bounce back. We hope it does. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, like I asked a minute ago, please mute. Um, and it's up to you if you'd like to be uh, seen or not. Um, that's your prerogative. This um, will be recorded and probably be made available to members in the future. So this Zoom will be um, recorded. Uh, I appreciate our speakers, Steph and John, for uh, allowing us to, to uh, record them. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of people online. So we also want to encourage questions. So questions will stop for a, a very short time after Steph's talk while John puts his um, talk up and urgent questions can be asked to Steph at that time. And then I'll ask you to hold the questions and discussion till after John's finished, if that's okay. Please use the chat function on the sidebar. Um, and if you're having a problem with that, um, it will get you to speak, but at the very end. So hold on to the questions. Um, just a quick bio, this is the information that you received in the email invitation today. Uh, St Dr. Steph McClellan is a geoscientist, communicator and works to understand environmental impacts on free ice areas in Antarctica. She is a superstar of STEM and if you don't know what that means, there's a link here for you. Uh, it just basically means she's awesome. Uh, and uh, we're very grateful that she's um, here today to talk to us. I heard her talking to some people in America about her experiences working in Antarctica and I thought, wow, this is perfect. Um, and I think I'd like to, to know about 
you know, what it was like working in Antarctica. Now I remembered my good friend, Dr. John Clark, and we've had Dr. John Clark speak to us a couple of times at the ACT branch. Um, look, he's just about done everything there is to be done in um, uh, geology in uh, Australia and on Mars. So why he's talking about Mars or his expertise is in terrestrial analogues of Martian landscapes. And I won't steal his thunder, but it should be really exciting. Uh, so apart from our work at Geoscience Australia, he's also heavily associated with the Mars Society of Australia. Again, um, the link there for your information. Just to advertise a little bit of the upcoming events, keep an eye on social media, your inbox for emails. Uh, the ASCG are trying really hard at the moment and always try really hard to show value to its members, but we're making a big effort to get webinars and information to you um, to make this time uh, a little bit more enjoyable, a little bit more geophysical. So with that, I will see if I can uh, carefully stop sharing, oops, and ask Steph if she would like to share and introduce Thanks, you. Thanks, Steph. Let's give this a go. All right, share. Can you see that slide? Is that coming through? Yes, it is. Great. All right, well, thanks everyone for um, logging on this afternoon. Um, as Marina said, my name's Steph. I'm a geologist at Geoscience Australia in Canberra, um, graduate of the University of Adelaide. And over the last few years, um, my research and I've been really drawing on my background in landscape evolution and sedimentology um, and sort of process geomorphology to look at the vulnerability of ice-free areas um, of Antarctica to, to physical impacts and, and to human impacts. Um, and so I've spent the last two summers um, in Antarctica. Um, in the last 18 months, I've spent close to six months in Antarctica in the Southern Ocean. So it's been a big part of my life now. Um, and when Marina asked me to talk about working in isolation, it really got me thinking about how isolated is Antarctica and what does that look like? And um, you know, what are the different ways we can think of um, isolation? And Certainly, I think for me, um, you know, it really, um, this image here uh, sums up so much of it. This is the back deck of the Aurora Australis, Australia's icebreaker, which was recently retired. Um, and this is us in, at the end of 2018, maybe a day out of Davis Station, um, 14 days voyage from Hobart through the Southern Ocean, um, you know, almost 5,000 kilometres um, away from Australia. And at this point, we're headbutting our way through thick sea ice um, up to a metre and a half thick, um, sometimes making only 50 metres of progress every sort of five to 10 minutes or so. It's a um, really spectacular, but slow, slow progress. Um, and, you know, going on this journey, there's a real sense of going somewhere, watching the ocean change, watching the wildlife change um, and feeling the air change as well as you get closer and closer to Antarctica. Um, and with that kind of isolation um, and sort of ruggedness, there's a huge sense and need for self-sufficiency um, as, as a station and as a community. And so this is setting up for the annual resupply of Davis Station. So there's the Aurora icebreaker parked in the sea ice, um, found a fairly stable piece and, and parked a couple kilometres from the station. Those lines that you can see in the sea ice there are essentially ice roads um, for all the machinery to go back and forth from the ship to bring containers ashore, um, heavy equipment um, and fuel. Refueling is probably the most important part of the resupply operation, pumping close to a million litres of diesel into tanks on shore to keep the station powered, to keep the machinery going, as well as dozens of drums of aviation kerosene, um, to keep the planes and helicopters flying as well, uh, to support field work, search and rescue operations, things like that. And actually just up to the left here, um, you can see a twin otter, um, small aircraft coming into land on the sea ice skiway, which is just out of view on the right hand side there. Uh, in terms of aviation, shipping, field operations, it's all self-contained within the station, all the communications, all the coordination of that. There's a lot of work that goes back and forth with um, the Antarctic Division headquarters in Hobart, but 
you know, when you're on the ground, you're, you're communicating um, to people on station. You're not talking to an air traffic control tower um, back in Australia. It's, it's all, um, you know, extremely well self-contained. But over summer, it's incredibly busy. Um, on station, there's over 90 people running around, getting things done, building things, fixing things, doing science. Um, and so in terms of feeling isolated, it's like, a, it's like another town or another city. It doesn't feel particularly lonely or, or even remote at times because it's so busy. Um, but every now and then you get a reminder um, that it is um, very isolated. And this was really brought home for me late last year um, when actually earlier this year um, in very early January, I think when the fire alarm went off at 2am. Um, this is us walking from trudging from the accommodation block down to the muster point in the mess. It's the middle of summer. So of course it's 24 hour daylight. So it's broad daylight um, at 2, 2.30 in the morning. Um, and as we were, you know, doing what we needed to do in an emergency and, and going to have our names ticked off, the fire department was springing into action um, and going to their sort of designated roles and um, checking out what was going on. And the fire department, uh, there is some electricians, a couple of plumbers, a weather observer, um, and a few other people as well, mechanics. Um, the command and control for an emergency is the radio comms operator, um, the station leader, the deputy station leader, who also happens to be one of the chefs. Um, and it was, although it was a false alarm, it was um, really at that point that made you stop and go, wow, like, yeah, we really are alone down here. Um, and if things turn to custard, um, we're on our own. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today um, over the next sort of 20 minutes or so, half an hour is give you a bit of an idea of what it's like working um, at a modern Antarctic station with Australia, um, but also a bit of background um, and history of Antarctica and, and ways that I think of, um, you know, how we think you know, um, its isolation has formed, um, some of its geological history and what keeps it so isolated. Um, to give you a bit of sense of the geography that we're talking about here, um, you know, we've got um, southern coast of Australia here. These red squares are our four um, permanent stations, um, three on the continent, Casey, Davis and Mawson. I've spent most of my time at Davis, um, but I've spent a bit of time at Casey as well. And this, um, these uh, brown wedges here are our Antarctic um, territorial claims, it's about 42% um, of the land mass of Antarctica. And yeah, as you can see, and with the ship journey, it's quite some distance from Australia, but of course it hasn't always been that way. So this is again, present day Antarctica. We've got our stations um, here along the Eastern coast. This is the Antarctic Peninsula that, that sort of comes out to touch um, towards South America. Um, and these are the sort of major um, tectonic domains or, you know, big geological domains um, in Antarctica and, and how they relate to um, the ancient supercontinent Gondwana. Um, and in our neck of the woods, um, so over sort of Davis and Mawson Way, we're seeing a lot of rocks um, that share affinities or, um, you know, conjugates with or correlatives with in modern day India. And what I think is actually quite Sort of poetic in a way is that one of the Indian research stations, Bharti, is actually just here in the Larsman Hills region um, and they have quite an extensive hard rock geology program and it makes complete sense because, you know, this was once part of India. Um, they're just, um, you know, back in their neck of the woods. As we come further around the coast uh, towards Casey, there's um, huge tracts of Antarctica that have their, um, have their match in, in um, in Australia. This is a pretty detailed um, image and I'll, I'll pick apart some of the key areas for you, but I think it's one of the, the nicest summaries that I've seen of um, the, you know, the major crustal blocks and, and tectonic elements of Antarctica and how they fit together in Gondwana. And so areas I draw your attention to again, you know, we've got Davis and Mawson here, and these are those um, Indian affinity um, tectonic domains and where they fit um, with modern day India. Um, and what its orientation was uh, when Gondwana was assembled. And as we come further around the coast towards, again, towards Casey here, you can see how Southern Western Australia and, and the Southern margin of Australia 
um, has you know huge connections. Um, you know, we we still have not just a presence in Antarctica, but still a really strong geological connection there. Australia and Antarctica were the very last continents of Gondwana to to come apart, and really important and really key part of that process was the opening um, south of Tasmania, the Tasmanian Gateway, um, through here. Because what that actually did was in creating an ocean through there, um, and then in time quite a deep ocean, is it started um, or enabled the Antarctic circumpolar current to start flowing. So the final separation of Australia and Antarctica sort of happened around 35 to 32 million years ago. And it was around this time um, and sometime later that this big deep ocean current, the circumpolar current started flowing. Around this uh, point in time as well, there was a big drop in ocean temperatures and the sort of detailed cause and effects um, are still contentious, but it was also around this time that um, Antarctica as a continent became glaciated and much more similar to what we, what we know and love today. Antarctica now is uniquely isolated by the power of the Antarctic um, circumpolar current. It's the largest current in the world. Uh, it flows from west to east. And these larger arrows here that you see sort of um, going sometimes in parallel and, and coming in together are the, the major fronts associated with it. So the uh, sub-Antarctic front to the north um, and the polar front to the south. And the second polar current is you know, hugely critical, um, hugely important in the whole planet, really. It's, it regulates the exchange of heat and carbon between the ocean and atmosphere. Um, influences how nutrients um, are distributed around the world, um, plays a really important role in structuring, uh, in vertically structuring the ocean. You can see that it sort of meanders and changes as it circles a little around Antarctica uh, due to the seafloor to topography, uh, the bathymetry. But other than that, it's completely unimpeded by land masses um, and really helps um, bring in bringing deep water um, down from the North Atlantic, uh, down into the Southern Ocean. This image here is the sea surface temperature. And again, those two fronts, the sub-Antarctic front and the polar front. Um, and you can see the, the huge change in um, ocean temperature that rings around um, Antarctica. And that's it's due to this current that we have, you know, the colder waters there isolated from the warmer stratified um, tropical waters to the north that keep, you know, Antarctica icy and, and windy and, and dry. Um, but you don't necessarily need to see, use satellites or sort of pan, pan continental or, or global scale models to observe it. We could see it on the ship. So this is the underway data um, taken from uh, the first voyage of 2018-19 summer. So basically that voyage that I took that photo from the heli deck. Um, and right, the, um, there's about, uh, I don't know, dozens of instruments, um, a whole range of parameters that are um, measured along the way. And so you can see we start off in Hobart here, we come south, resupply Davis Station, and then come back to Hobart um, here in late November. What I draw your attention to is this big jump here in conductivity and seawater temperature. That's happening over a period of about six or seven hours. Um, you basically go to sleep, wake up, and the ocean, te the seawater temperatures dropped by about um, seven or eight degrees um, just in that time. And so we could see that, you know, tracking um, on the live data streams. It's, it's, you know, it's quite marked. Um, and it's this really persistent, harsh climate um, and big changes associated with these fronts. Um, you know, that are a function of what happened millions of years ago um, in geological history that kept, that have kept Antarctica isolated, um, you know, for so long and truly for so much longer than anywhere else in the world. Um, you know, if you look back in time, you know, Antarctica really wasn't discovered. Um, it was, there was sort of, you know, dribs and drabs of voyages that, um, that were able to discover pieces of Antarctica and, but the idea of it goes back a really long way, um, you know, back to the time of Aristotle and Ptolemy and early classical geography, there was this idea that the land masses in the north had to be balanced somewhere in the south. Um, and this map 
um, from the 18th century actually shows um, land yet undiscovered um, and then what they call this um, great reservoir from the frozen northern sea or Siberia. And it depicts a frozen sea at the South Pole to mirror that that's in the Arctic. Um, but it really wasn't until sort of around 1820 that Antarctica was properly sighted um, by the Russians. As I said, there were a lot of expeditions, um, you know, through the 1800s um, to, to prove the existence of Antarctica and to, um, to try and penetrate through the pack ice um, to discover it further. Um, and of course, Mawson's expedition um, was a really, uh, is a really key expedition scientifically um, and historically in Australia. But it was also, um, it was that expedition that created the first uh, radio link um, to the rest of the world. So they established communications with Australia. Um, here we've got a, um, one of the wireless operators and mechanics um, operating, I think in around 19, uh, 1912, would have been at Commonwealth Bay. Um, and this is actually one of the transmitting station or a transmitting station at Macquarie Island. Um, accounts say that keeping the mast scenarios up at Commonwealth Bay, which is um, shown to be one of the windiest places in the world was extremely difficult. Um, there's also issues with uh, radio transmission and um, atmospheric in interference, but you know, it's when you think over a hundred years ago, um, they were able to, to get a radio connection to Australia. Um, that's pretty extraordinary. Obviously communication um, has improved and technology's improved over the years. Um, and it's a really important part of advancing science and for keeping expeditioners happy and, um, and, and safe and, and mentally well um, while we're down there. Um, a really interesting part of Australia's communication past um, in Antarctica is for quite a long time, all expeditioners had were telexes, um, so telegrams, and character, characters were really limited with those. You only got a certain number of characters allocated per year. So they came up with the WISA codes. Um, these five letter um, sort of codes based on a, uh, on a military um, code mm -hmm. that stood for, that basically had like a little um, dictionary or encyclopedia of meanings. And so some of my favorites um, were telling people at home that we've just had a blizzard. Um, I've had minor frostbite. The food is first rate and I've put on some weight. Um, also that I've grown a beard, which is generally admired. Um, there are quite a few wizard codes about beards. Um, another one was, I've grown a beard, it's awful, and I'll probably shave it off uh, before I get back to Australia. Um, but I think it's this kind of connection to the rest of the world and these technological advances um, that have increased our understanding of Antarctica, the role it plays in Earth systems, um, and have really um, you know, improved the, um, the feeling of isolation down there um, and of course, now we're connected by satellite. Um, we have really quite good satellite um, connection. This is um, the Yanari Sat Dome at one of the stations. There's one of these at each station um, to keep us connected to the outside world. And whether that's through social media, um, WhatsApp these days, um, you know, we've, um, this year I Skyped into a meeting in Canberra, um, but as well, they can transmit um, quite large volumes of scientific data in real time as well um, for certain experiments and studies that are going on I think, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, mapping Antarctica, it's, um, you know, the modern way of looking at it is on an order that, I mean, even 20 years ago, we could barely have dreamt about, but certainly I don't think, um, you know, scientists like Mawson could have ever dreamed about. Um, I think this is really nicely um, exemplified in the reference elevation model of Antarctica, uh, REMA, that was released just a couple years ago. Um, this digital surface model um, that um, resolves Antarctica down to eight meters um, and in some places down to two meters. This is version one. Version two um, will go down to two meters and it's using um, basically stereographic pairs uh, of digital elevation models, hundreds of thousands of them from platforms like Worldview one, two, three um, and Adelaide, other satellites. Um, and they're all time stamped. And so we can use that um, to track change, obviously, um, through the future. 
the entire data sets 150 terabytes. Um, so not exactly something you'd want to download, um, but a couple of the highlights um, are here. You can see rumples on the license sea ice shelf. Um, and this large crack here is what turned into um, the A68 iceberg, which carved in July 2017. It was over 5,000 square kilometres. Um, so being able to track something of that scale over time um, is pretty phenomenal if we're looking at um, ice dynamics and things like that. Also over on the right here, um, it's at a resolution. This linear feature here is actually the ice runway that Australia has um, at Wilkins near Casey Station. Um, so yeah, pretty phenomenal data set. More than ever though, it's really important to understand what's not just on the surface of the ice, but underneath it as well. Um, and to understand the influence of the solid earth on ice sheet mass balance, whether it's um, the role of the topography in, in damming or creating flow paths for ice, um, geothermal heat flux, um, glacial isostatic adjustment, um, and understanding mantle viscosity um, to feed into those sorts of models. Um, you know, increasingly seeing um, really impressive um, ways of understanding that sub-ice topography and geology as well. Um, and this is a recent release bed machine. There's also bed map. Um, I think we're up to iteration three of bed map um, to better understand, you know, what is lying above the sea level and particularly, you know, is there ice, um, what parts of the ice sheet are lying below sea level that could make them um, quite susceptible to incursion from warm ocean water. Um, and driving faster collapse of ice shelves than just atmospheric warming alone. It's not just about the um, ice sheet and Antarctica itself. Um, you know, over time we're seeing, um, you know, better understanding of um, teleconnections and connections between Australia um, and Antarctica and a, a great example of this. Uh, with these sort of long distance climate anomalies um, was an Australian um, research program that showed that dome, uh, that law dome just here, so basically out the back door of Casey Station, when they compared snowfall records um, of 750 years um, of snowfall uh, at law dome in an ice core with meteorological records from Australia, um, that there's a, actually a direct link, not necessarily causal, um, but what they're what they've been able to show is that cool, dry air is flowing um, towards north towards southwest Australia, um, creating drought or very little rain. Um, and but at the same time, there's a, a southerly flow of warm, moist, moist air down towards East Antarctica, um, which is driving higher snowfall. So in terms of you know modern isolation and, and what that looks like, um, you know working, living um, in Antarctica is, is very different to how it was even just 20 years ago, um, but it's still not a terribly environment, easy environment to work in. Um, this was a, um, uh, it wasn't quite a blizzard, it was a near blizzard um, that we had uh, earlier this year and the winds topped out at about 160 kilometers an hour. Um, and you know, that's at the point where you're needing someone to help you walk between buildings because, um, you know, you're essentially getting blown over. If someone went over to a different building, you'd call um, to make sure that they were okay and that they didn't need um, assistance. And at that point, you know, forget traveling off station. Um, it's, it's even tricky to get around station. Um, and, and weather is still very much the, the biggest impediment um, or the biggest, one of the bigger, um, Sort of delays that we have um, and impacts on daily sort of operations. But when it's great, it's really great. Um, Davis and the Vestfold Hills, the area I work, um, has the nickname of the Riviera of the South. Um, in summer, it's, you know, temperatures seven, eight degrees Celsius. Um, and, you know, when it's sunny and the wind drops, you need to be in almost shorts and t-shirt. Um, it's incredibly, um, you know, beautiful and, and calm and stunning um, with the ice sheet in the, in the background here and frozen lakes um, and just no one around for miles. It feels incredibly um, quiet um, and, and isolated. And, and yet we're not, we're not out alone and we're not out, um, you know, unsupported. You know, we have with us in our packs, our, our packs that we take with us everywhere. We've got all the equipment and redundancies that we need 
should a helicopter not be able to come in and, and pick us up um, at the end of the day for whatever reason, um, if the weather turns um, or someone's injured, um, we've got enough equipment with us um, to stay warm and dry um, and hunker down if we need to. But we're not working every single day, although it feels like it. Um, you know, there's plenty of other things um, that are important when working in isolation. One of those is Christmas. Um, and so this was, you know, just a fraction of what we had for Christmas lunch. There's seafood and, um, you know, a huge um, team effort to, to make Christmas um, and those sorts of celebrations really special. Um, they hold quite a lot of significance. There's other events that are marked through the year. Um, Midwinter, uh, held on the winter solstice, is a particularly um, probably one of the biggest events um, in the Antarctic expedition, a calendar, um, you know, hugely important um, occasion to mark. Um, we had, you know, like I'm finding now in isolation, baking and, and food is really important, um, a real source of, source of comfort. Um, you know, people are really willing to share their expertise. And so this was our Austrian chef last year, Herman, doing a masterclass in apple strudel um, and how to make apple strudel for 100 people. Exercise is uh, also really important, as everyone knows, in isolation. Um, at Davis, there's a rock climbing wall um, in the storage warehouse largely used for search and rescue training, um, but we also um, open it up for recreational um, rock climbing um, and also, you know, having a good um, time um, and celebrating, you know, when we can on the weekends. Um, this feels like an age ago, given everyone so close, <laughs> so close quarters, um, but, you know, people bring together um, bands and, um, you know, you have dress up parties and things like that. Um, if you look closely, you'll actually see there's a six foot tall polar bear there making, a, making an appearance. Communication and um, aircraft are, you know, I think some of the biggest um, connections and, and ways that we stay connected um, to Antarctica these days um, and in more ways than one. So up the top, right up in the distance there, it's actually a Qantas 747. Um, we had a a tourist flyover, a sightseeing flyover when we were at Casey. Um, that plane was one of those um, tourist day trips that they do um, out of Sydney and Melbourne. We knew they were coming over. Um, and so we all headed outside to give them a wave. At that point though, we'd been waiting several weeks to get home. Um, the ice runway wasn't cold enough to land a plane on it yet. So it was a little bit adding, a little bit of adding salt to the wound um, to look up at a passenger jet and, um, know that all those people were going home that night and we were staying where we were um, at least for a little while longer. The commute um, in Antarctica is a commute like no other. Um, this is a um, Air Force C-17 that we came home on um, this year. It's a four and a half, four and a half hour flight. Um, wouldn't say it's a terribly comfortable one, but um, I don't think I've ever been um, so relieved to have a, um, you know, feel an aircraft taxiing down the runway um, after waiting three weeks uh, to get home. And yeah, so it's, um, you know, commute essentially like cargo. Um, you're in there with, you know, dozer tracks and scientific equipment and, and various cargo, but um, it's really an experience like no other. Um, and, you know, it happens, um, you know, there's delays and there's um, really quick changes of plan. The, the mantra in, in Antarctic work is hurry up and wait. It's um, rush, 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 and then you just have to sit and maybe wait for ages. Um, and then it's rush, 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 and then um, you'll have to just sit tight and, and wait, for things to, um, wait, to thing, wait for things to pan out. So I think, you know, modern transport um, and communications have completely you know, revolutionised Antarctica. We're not in the heroic age of um, exploration anymore and we're um, certainly not, you know, taking dog teams over glaciers. Um, and, you know, it's very much a modern uh, work environment, but it's still very unpredictable, still very changeable um, with a lot of unknowns. And so, you know, going from that isolation to current isolation, you know, there are definitely some, um, you know, lessons and some, um, you know, similarities of, um, how to approach it, just rolling with the punches, controlling what you can control, um, making the most of what you have and, and really taking joy in the little things, whether it's, um, you know, a, a cup of hot noodles after a three hour bus ride to get up to the ice, um, 
whether it's, um, you know, finding a, a book that you'd forgotten you brought down um, as something new to read and engage with when you've read all your other books. So I'll leave it there. Um, hopefully that's given you a, a bit of insight into um, Antarctica, its isolation, you know, why it's so isolated um, and also uh, what it's like to work there now. Thank you. Uh, Steph, imagine that we're all clapping and cheering and going, <laughs> wow, look at those photos. That's an amazing summary of some of your experiences in Antarctica. I am very jealous. Ron Hackney says, I am jealous of the whole experience. Um, there's a lot of um, thank you very much is coming up on the Zoom chat group. Please add your comments in uh, here. Um, if there isn't any, nobody's asked a question during your talk, so I'll give them everybody a couple of seconds. If you've got a question you'd like to ask now rather than wait till the end of John's talk, um, pop it up now. But Steph, that was a great insight to um, working in isolation and, and a lot of parallels to what we're going through at the moment where you know I get to see my family all the time um, and our neighbours a little bit less and I don't get to see anybody else so I kind of feel like we're, we're a bit like that um, but without the, um, the risk of having to be self-reliant I think that's an extra step that uh, I'm grateful that I hadn't actually thought about and uh, there's a lot of things we've um, being concerned about uh, particularly around medication um, and access to toilet rolls uh, but they haven't been anything um, like what you were describing I should start my video uh, so really appreciate that Phil Wynn has asked um, what was the one thing you missed that you didn't expect to miss and the answer is me I oh, know I mean what is your answer Steph Obviously you, Marina. Um, but the other thing that I really missed that I didn't expect to miss um, was probably milk. Um, so all the milk is powdered. Um, and if you're the last to use up glass in your jug, you have to mix up more powdered milk um, just because taking even, you know, Tetra Pak milk um, is, you know, several shipping containers worth. Um, so, yeah, getting, getting back and having a, a flat white with real milk was just next level. Yeah. That's fantastic. Can you give us um, an idea of what was one of your Christmas gifts? Uh, so we do um, Christmas with Kris Kringle. So people are randomly matched. Um, and so I got um, a fabulous tea towel actually um, of um, like a cartoon of the Aurora um, icebreaker, which, yeah, now that it's retired, um, I feel like is a, is a real collector's item. So, yeah, it was really great to receive that. That's fantastic. Look, um, everybody, thanks. Um, I'm going to invite John. Uh, John, are you there? And do you want to see if you can pop up your slides again? Now, just a reminder, John um, is a Mars expert and he's going to be talking to us about Mars. Um, and I have a feeling that some of his photos are going to be nearly the opposite of what Steph's shown. Instead of white, they might be a little bit orange. Um, hi, John. Welcome to the ACG Talk. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, have you been able to work out how to share your screen? Uh, well, um, uh, hi, Marina. I've uh, got my video on, so you should be able to see me. Is that correct? We can see you, yes. Absolutely. Well, I'll press the share screen button. I'll leave you to it. Thanks, John. You should be able to see my um, my script, my um, talk. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Struggling with the technology. Um, Trust me, he got it right the first time. There we go. There we oh. go. How how cool is that? Well done. All right. And I just have to go to the full screen here. Bingo. And that can go away. All right. So. <coughs> It is the complete opposite of Steph's wonderful talk because uh, I'll be talking about living uh, in a Mars simulation at the other end of the world, um, 75 degrees north rather than 70 odd degrees uh, south. Where did I go? Well, uh, we went to a location called FMARS, the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station, which is on Devon Island. Uh, it's the largest uninhabited island in the world. 75 degrees north, as I said, it's two thirds the size of Tasmania, and it's a long way from anywhere. So Davis Station 
is about four and a half thousand kilometers from Perth. Um, F Mars is four and a half thousand kilometers from San Francisco, basically the distance from uh, Perth to Singapore. And we get there by flying. Uh, the um, special flights start when you leave from Yellowknife uh, on the shores of the Great Slave Lake and you fly for um, nearly three hours north across the tundra, across the Arctic Ocean and the pack ice till you arrive at a place called uh, Resolute Bay, which is a little Inuit community and the logistics station for most operations in the Canadian Arctic. And you basically hang around there until the weather is good enough to board a little twin otter and uh, fly to wherever you're going. In my case, we flew across the Wellington Strait to Devon Island, uh, landed on a convenient bit of dirt, uh, threw everything out, literally threw everything out of the um, uh, Twin Otter. You haven't lived till you've uh, uh, wrangled a quarter ton quad bike out of the back of a Twin Otter uh, with just three people. Um, and then the plane flies off and you sit there looking around and thinking the possibilities are many. What were we doing there? Well, as a geologist, I was doing geology. Uh, the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station is located uh, in the middle of the Horton Impact Crater, which uh, is a Miocene to Eocene age uh, impact crater, 22 kilometers across. Uh, there's permafrost, 60 centimeters or less uh, beneath the surface, even in midsummer. There's patterned ground. The rocks are essentially evaporites and carbonates of Paleozoic age. So you get stromatolites and, and fossils and so on. But the main impact, main feature you're there to study is the impact crater itself. And as you're wandering around this landscape, uh, you, you have to keep reminding yourself that uh, this landscape formed in about two minutes. You know, the whole shallow bowl that you're exploring, the overturned rocks along the rim, the hundreds of meters of impact retcher and impact melts, uh, all the result of a cataclysm that formed all of this, you know, 15 to 30 odd million years ago uh, in a matter of a minute or two at the most. And there's obviously been post-impact slumping and post-impact uh, deposition. Uh, one of the creeks in the area is called Rhinoceros Creeks because there are remains of uh, Miocene rhinoceri in there, which uh, is rather odd when you look at the current landscape. And it's been used by NASA and others like the Mars Society for uh, over 20 years now, uh, because in many ways, this landscape has uh, Martian-like features. Uh, you've got permafrost, you've got uh, with frozen ground, you've got polygons, you've got uh, innovation hollows, and uh, people use it to test different exploration technologies uh, different human factors associated with living in and working in remote areas. Uh, and being a geologist, I was doing all the things I would do on Earth as a geologist, except all of our research, all of our outside research was done wearing simulated spacesuits. So compared to uh, working on Earth uh, or in the field in Alice Springs or wherever, you're wearing a big bulky suit, you've got a backpack that has your uh, water supply, it has your power for your radios, it's got your power for the ventilation system with air being forced into the helmet uh, and so on. And yeah, you're isolated from the environment. You don't hear anything except the fans, conversations over the radio, uh, you don't, you've got very poor visibility and you've got very poor ta tactical awareness in terms of the, the tactile sensors um, as you sort of walk over the land and you, you handle rocks and so on. And this is what we call operations studies. So when people talk about researching in Mars analog environments, uh, they often talk about uh, factors such as isolation, uh, factors such as enclosure, uh, and they are different types of research you can do in other facilities. So for example, if you're interested in uh, enclosure, um, there's a picture on the top right there of the Mars 500 facility at the Institute for Biomedical Problems in Moscow. And there's my friend Diego Urbina, who was in there for 520 days, isolated from the outside world. Of course, they're just on the other side of a porthole, but there's important research you can do in that sort of thing. 
uh, people who study human spaceflight psychology and the potential uh, analogs for Mars and deep space missions and so on, they're also interested, interested in the experience of submariners. Uh, that's isolated, very isolated, because they have all essentially zero communications uh, with the outside world and certainly very enclosed. Antarctica is another example, uh, not so much enclosed, and Stephanie mentioned that you know, life goes on more or less as normal, uh, but the difference is really are isolated, particularly over winter. And in most cases, if something goes wrong, you've got to deal with it with the resources you have to hand and live with the consequences for many months until there is a, a relief, relief flight or relief voyage there. And the International Space Station is, of course, another type of analog. What it might be like to live and work on Mars or the Moon? Uh, except, of course, it's in Earth orbit and not on a planetary surface. But we were doing what we call analog research, operations research. So we are living in our little station, all six of us, uh, Paul from uh, the US, Anastasia from Russia, uh, Alex uh, over by the uh, communication system there uh, from France, Yusuke from Japan, and uh, Anushri from India. And we'd, done, we'd actually done a similar uh, mission six months before. We spent three months in a similar facility in Utah, and we're now repeating that experience uh, in the Arctic. This is the upper deck of our station. Uh, it's our, our living area, our uh, relaxation area. We each had individual cabins, which I'm sort of sitting on top, looking down from a sort of mezzanine loft uh, type area. Uh, geographically isolated, uh, communications isolated. We had uh, 50 megabytes of uh, internet per day over a satellite link. So all communications, apart from, from very, very small photos for our daily reports, uh, were all done as text messages. So we're very much on our own resources. And there's a view of the lower deck, uh, the work area. Uh, all sorts of activities go there. Anastasia is riding the bicycle to keep fit. Uh, several other people there are uh, getting ready to go out on a simulated EVA, so they're suiting up. And when you go outside, you just don't walk outside. You actually got to go through a simulated depressurization and repressurization uh, period. It takes about five minutes. And there's also bench state, uh, space there for basic uh, uh, handling of samples for biological work, taxonomy work on fungi with various chemicals and so on. And out of the picture to the right is a, a shower and a toilet and uh, all the other uh, essentials. Now there's all sorts of interesting little things that you have uh, when you're in a, a station that's about 20 years old up in the Arctic uh, and you're fighting a constant battle with mold. Uh, the Arctic is a cold desert, but the humidity is about 100%. So Mold gets everywhere. It gets into the crannies, there's water trickling down the walls and gardens in the mold, food left over from the last crew uh, in, in packets of wheat beaks or whatever, and become uh, jungles of mold. And you're fighting a constant battle with bleach and uh, peroxide and other interesting chemicals. You try and reduce the humidity down by running uh, dehumidifiers, six, seven, eight hours a day, which bring the humidity down to about 75%, and then you turn them off, and things get uh, humid again very, very quickly. Uh, you, want, you get your bag ready for when you fly out, you lift it up and there's mold growing underneath it. Um, Indian colleague Anushri had really long hair and one night I dreamt that she got hair, mold in her hair and we had to shave it all off. So it sort of starts preying on your mind eventually. And then there's the bears. Uh, while when you go on your simulated uh, EBA, uh, the two of you who are doing that, uh, usually a scientist and a support person. Uh, you're in your suits, you're following the EVA protocols, but there's also a silent partner, the bear guard. And we took turns of this, and uh, the bear guard follows you around. Uh, he or she would do photographic work, the documentation of what you're doing. Uh, but the main job is to keep a lookout with a pump action shotgun uh, for any bears. And bears, we, we can see tracks of bears. They've been seen around there uh, at various times and uh, they're apex predators. So as far as you're concerned, you're food. Fortunately, we didn't see any. Uh, it's a $20,000 fine if you shoot a polar bear, even in self-defense. So you have to really value your, uh, your colleagues. A few other things. Um, what do you do with the toilet? Well, you can't just sort of 
have a septic tank or anything like that. So you burn each other's poo, you know, in an incinerator. It doesn't, it doesn't smell anywhere near so bad as you might think. And you pee in a funnel. The romance of polar exploration, the romance of space travel. And you're working hard, you're working, uh, you're busy, uh, you are, you do have downtimes, uh, especially when the weather's bad, a lot of the time it was, so you have to cancel activities, it's going to be completely plagued with fog. Uh, but even on the downtimes, you're working about 12, uh, 12, 11 hours a day, uh, like in the Antarctic, there's permanent uh, sunlight, or at least daylight uh, for the time we're up there. Uh, right towards the end, we started getting a little bit of darkness for just an hour or two every night. And you enjoy the view. This is the view across the crater. Uh, the white material looks like concrete is actually the impact melt sheets and the station itself is right on the rim. And there's the station and the six of us uh, outside. Uh, I can't remember whether this, I think this is at the start of the expedition. We're a little bit cleaner than uh, uh, than we were at the end, uh, but we were a happy bunch, and I would do it again with this crew anytime, anywhere. All right, Marina asked me to talk a little bit about the implications, what lessons or reflections I might have on uh, the current situation where uh, we are in isolation, physical isolation, hopefully not social isolation from each other. Uh, what lessons perhaps for this time I could draw from that experience up in the Arctic? And of course, the first thing I need to point out is that there are also many differences. I can't think of anyone who volunteered for the situation that we're in now, whereas people who go to the Arctic or indeed the Antarctic, uh, you've chosen to go there. It's something you've been looking forward to, it's something you've been planning for months, if not years. Uh, and it has a definite end time. And as this afternoon's activity shows, we've got excellent communications. We've got email, we've got Zoom, we've got telephones, we've got everything that you possibly wish to have for non-direct contact communication. You even write a letter if you're so inclined. So there are differences. But several, several things I think do map across. I think one of the things to do is when you're living in a remote area, as opposed to normal life or the rest of your life, you, could, you must focus on what you can do, not what you can't. It's no use grizzling about the fact you can't have a, um, a nice meal at a restaurant or, a, or whatever, because you just can't do it. But you think about what you can do, uh, the meals you can cook at home. Um, you focus on the positive. You don't keep reflecting, oh, I can't do this, I can't see that, I can't give my, uh, uh, have a coffee with my friends, I can't give my uh, children if they live away from home a hug or anything like that. You just focus on what is positive. The time that you have to yourself to, to reflect, the ability to focus on your work, the ability to enjoy a more relaxed um, schedule. It's important to have a, a routine, uh, not so much in the Arctic, because we're, we're pretty experienced by then. When we went to the Utah station, uh, for the first month we were working flat out, uh, initially just getting things ready and then going into the um, isolation mode. And we were completely exhausted. So after that, we took one day off, uh, quite rigorously, one day off a week. And that was enough to break the, uh, uh, break the, constant pressure of work because in my simulation just like the work we're doing at home you can't get away and the temptation is just then to uh, stay in your computer fiddling away that's always not always working efficiently for 12 14 hours a day till you go to bed then you can't sleep establish a routine a start time a finish time uh, people who know me would be staggered but both in utah and the arctic i was always the first one out of bed i would you know, get the coffee going, I'd lay the table for breakfast and then the other sluggards would gradually come out. In the Arctic, the alarm clock was going outside and starting the generator. Uh, a little bit of discipline and programming works wonders. There's opportunities to do things you never did before. Um, in the Arctic, of course, you're learning to do things like firearms training and uh, 
uh, when you're walking on ice on some of the, when we're waiting at Resolute Bay, you learn uh, safety skills associated with that. And that, that adds to the experience that you might otherwise have. What can you do at home? Well, you could read War and Peace if you've never read it before. You, know, you can binge watch your favorite uh, uh, TV series or your favorite movies or the great movies, uh, whatever you don't normally do, but you always want to do, here's an opportunity to do at least some of them. Celebrate milestones. Uh, Christmas, as Stephanie mentioned. Uh, we need to celebrate uh, birthdays. We had two birthdays in the Arctic, one in Utah, and yeah, we had parties each time. Yeah, treat yourself. Uh, couldn't do much in the Arctic, but get a takeaway meal. Uh, get something to deliver it for you. Go outside, regular exercise, uh, garden if that's your thing. I love gardens, but I must say it's housework for me, but I do enjoy all the work that my wife does in the garden. And go for a walk, go for a bike ride. Um, whatever it is, maintain contact with the physical world. And work hard in your relationships. Uh, just because we are physically cut off from each other, we can still ring people up, we can still message them, we can still talk to them on Skype or Zoom or whatever. And we need our friends, we need our family more than we ever do at times like this. And if you're going to watch something, and I'm going to read something, make sure it's inspirational. Um, now it's probably not a good time to watch uh, zombie movies or dystopias or post-apocalypse stories. Uh, watch something about people doing amazing things in difficult situations. That would be my recommendation. But hey, if Post-apocalypse stories are uh, what floats your boat, go for it. And like I said, it was an amazing experience. I'll do it again, anytime, with the same people. Uh, pandemic's not the same, but if you approach it with the right attitude, you know, we can all come out of it with lessons for living, lessons for life that enrich us all. Thanks. John, well, very well said. Again, imagine us all, round of applause, large, large clapping. Look, what an amazing experience you've been uh, privileged to have, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I, my question is exactly, I was going to ask what uh, Ron Hackney's asked. Would you go on one of those one-way missions to Mars? Oh, no. I'd like to come back and uh, tell my grandchildren about it. I, I'm sure in the end, people will go to Mars one way to settle it. I, I'm, I'm reasonably confident about that. But for the first few times, the first few uh, decades or even centuries or so, people will go there initially on expeditions, then to uh, stations where they may spend several years before they come home. And that builds up the knowledge, builds up the skills that we need to eventually live on the red planet. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, I see Patrice says, there are many similarities between Steph and John's experiences and ocean racing completely dependent on weather's whims, uh, self-reliance, sleep and comfort, maybe lack of comfort and discovering skills you didn't know you had. So maybe I should have asked Patrice to, to join this talk and talk about his um, uh, experience in ocean racing. Thanks for that, Patrice. I see a lot of similarities and I see some, some significant differences, but both overlap with our current situation. Uh, and probably more so for those who are a bit vulnerable, I, I've got a couple of um, health conditions which has made me really um, sort of, I don't know if the word's quarantine or self-isolate, but I've been um, really restricted in what I've been allowed to do, I've been able to get out and do exercise. So it, it's been really great to hear um, both of your experiences and something I know I've done um, that's similar to what you both did was I've taken photos and appreciated the little things. So lots again, uh, lots of thanks, John, um, and thanks to Steph. Uh, great advice uh, from uh, James Goodwin says, great advice, uh, good talk. Um, I'm sure you can see the comments. Um, a very informative and entertaining. Thanks, Nadej. Um, and uh, Mark says, uh, thanks, John and Steph, very interesting talks. Nice to see some familiar names connected online. Hi to everybody from uh, uh, Mark. Uh, John, what was, uh, John, what was the most single interesting experience you had, had out there on Devon Island? It's hard to say. Uh, it's just, it, the whole time was just so exciting and, and so mind blowing. Uh, it was all, it was all amazing. I've talked about time at the station, but 
spending almost a month living in a little community Inuit community and getting to know uh, know the people there and uh, and how that worked and seeing uh, just seeing that this, this tiny little town self-sufficient with this clinic and a school and this little church it was just it was just extraordinary there were more dogs and people very cute huskies if you like huskies um, I think just being out on the edge it was just an enormous privilege and that's one other comment reflecting back to what I was saying earlier most people here have some experience of working away from home uh, on cruises on uh, field trips so if you haven't done that maybe you went to boarding school uh, maybe you had to live away from home uh, because you came from a upcountry area and to finish your education you had to board or flat or whatever uh, we can dig deep into all of those experiences uh, and draw on them for living through this time as well so you know in the arctic i thought well when I arrived there, you know, heck, I'm in the Arctic. Yeah, it's freezing cold. Well, it wasn't actually. It was about like a Canberra winter, really. Uh, but I think, yeah, all right. You now, when I first started doing bushwalking in winter in Tasmania, these were the lessons. Yeah, you know, you, you apply those lessons. And um, most of us have life experiences, large or small, we can draw on that, it, that empower us through these sort of times. Thanks, John. I've got a question from Todd in WA. It's, it's fantastic. I'm, I'm like um, somebody mentioned earlier, uh, it's great to see people from all over Australia. I'm, uh, and a lot of familiar names here. Um, I might direct this one to Steph first. Steph, um, and off mute before we <laughs> try and answer it. Um, did you see anyone develop any problems while they were there um, in isolation area in Antarctica? Or were you just too busy and having too much fun? I'll let Steph go first, and I'll throw in my five cents. Um, a really um, common issue in, in summer expedition is, is sort of maintaining a good circadian rhythm uh, with 24 hour daylight. You're not getting the natural cues to go to sleep um, that you would normally. I was pretty lucky. I didn't really have too many issues with it. Um, and certainly sort of being out all day, walking, you know, 10 to 15 kilometers and picking up rocks um, certainly tuckered me out. Um, there's a doctor on station. They um, give really good advice on maintaining good sleep hygiene and um, you know helping people um, with that. So I didn't I didn't see it too much, but I certainly know um, some people suffer pretty badly from it. Um, and also certainly being um, on the ship on the way down, I remember um, I fortunately don't get seasick, but some people really suffer. Um, and I remember. Um, once we got to the sea ice, things really calmed down quite a lot. And it was probably day 12 or day 13. And I saw someone at lunch and I went, I've never seen you before. There's only 150 people or so, uh, 50 or so people on the ship. So you get to know everyone pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, they'd basically been in their cabin the whole way. Um, uh, just really, really seasick. So yeah, there's there's definitely some issues, but um, you know, fortunately now there's um, good good drugs and, and good advice to stop them becoming too bad. Thanks, Steph. John? Uh, I'm tempted to say what happens with the expedition stays on the expedition, but no. I think it helped with the fact that we were a very carefully selected crew. Uh, so before we went to Utah, er everyone except Anushri, the Indian woman, had actually spent at least some time in MDRS before. That's, that's the Utah station. Uh, and uh, Anushri had actually been part of mission control for that station. So she had a very good idea of what was going on. Uh, on top of that, everybody had spent time with at least one other person uh, previously, and in some cases, two or three other people on the expedition. So we, we knew each other quite well. We knew what to expect. Uh, and uh, by the time it came to the Arctic, we had three months under, almost three months under our belt working together. Uh, and so, no, I mean, any friction, in fact, really the only friction was between us and, and mission control. Who, of course, always, you know, the, the head office never has any idea what's going on in the real world. And they probably wondered, what were you getting up to? But that's why the Arctic was actually much better than, uh, than Utah, because those communications were far less, and we could do our own thing much more and being constantly yapped at by uh, mission control or mission support, so that this, that, and the other. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're like family, those people. They're a good family, and yeah. 
I guess this is a part two to that question. I'll stay with John and then pop, jump back to Steph. John, did you and your team undergo psychological testing or have some psychological training before the trips? Not specifically because uh, the mission uh, uh, programmer uh, selected us because she knew that we we're the sort of people who uh, would be able to cope. And uh, Shannon Rupert, who's the mission director, uh, is someone I've been working with on these sort of programs for nearly 20 years. Uh, and uh, she'd worked with these other people for, yes, five, 10, 15 years as well. So she had a pretty good idea of how we would cope under stress. We were, however, guinea pigs in research progr uh, programs from a uh, university in uh, Germany, uh, for someone who's collecting data for their PhD, uh, and also for the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow. So we had various tests and quizzes and, and uh, interviews uh, and diaries that we had to keep. Uh, but it wasn't, that was only a very, very small part of what we were doing. The main thing we're doing is actually going out there and working and working outside is one of the best pluses for mental health of anything. Um, Steph, um, obviously, uh, even if you did or didn't undergo the testing, you must have passed. But did you have psychological testing or any sort of training? Um, no, so there's a pretty extensive medical um, to go south. Um, I think the sort of screening questionnaire was about 14 pages. And then there's the actual medical. And I feel like they took litres of blood to test for all sorts of things. Um, it was pretty extensive. Um, Essentially, we weren't going there long enough to need psychological testing. I think the thresholds maybe around three months or more. Um, people go through that, um, and certainly for expeditioners um, who are working there as part of the trades and other roles, they'll go through um, kind of a selection process that also looks at social cohesion and how you work in teams and under stress um, yeah. and in those sorts of situations as well. So it's um, it's pretty well screened, not necessarily extensively among the scientists though. Um, a very important question that I'll ask you both, Steph and John. Steph first. Did you um, have any practical experience in growing potatoes? It's more for John, but I'll ask Steph. I haven't seen the movie, but I think I know where this is coming from. Um, there is actually a small hydroponic setup um, on the stations, and so that provides some leafy greens and herbs and things like that. Um, obviously, over summer with a pretty big population, that's sort of like one lettuce leaf each. Um, and I certainly remember when, you know, the chefs had been harvesting, just like tearing off a basil leaf and mm. inhaling it because it was just the smell of summer. Um, but yeah, mostly things are brought in frozen, dried, um, refrigerated um, and kept for the year, yeah. Including potatoes. Including potatoes. But the seafood, does anybody catch that down there or do you import that as well? That's all imported. Yeah, there's no Whoa. fishing allowed. Gosh, I think, okay, there you go. That's interesting. Yeah. If you, want, oh, um, yeah. if you yeah. want tips in food preservation, um, yeah, Antarctica is the way to, to do it. Eggs <laughs> do are it. fresh. Um, it's amazing what they can keep fresh. Oh, wow. John, potatoes. Uh, the only potatoes we had were uh, sort of uh, dead potatoes, you know, freeze-dried powder or, or, or uh, mush. So, yeah, it was all freeze-dried. Uh, it's quite extraordinary in the US how you can buy almost every vegetable imaginable that's been freeze-dried, probably a few that shouldn't be, like cabbage. Uh, and uh, there's the old doomsday preppers, I suppose. And they're, they're actually cheaper than ordinary veg fresh vegetables. And so we lived on quite an amazing diversity of diet. Uh, I lost three kilos, four kilos down there. Uh, I think because you're working physically very hard and because everything's freeze dried, you, you hardly anything's fried. It's all just, you know, boiled or, mm. or whatever. So it, it was interesting. Uh, potatoes, we did actually grow uh, little ex hydroponics in our rooms with automated hydroponic setups, which would sort of gurgle through the night and stimulated some people to check downstairs to go to the toilet. Uh, and by the end of the, uh, by the end of the three months, this is in Utah, by the, by the end of the three months, the uh, lettuces and the herbs and things were ready to eat. So we slaughtered our vegetables on the, on the second last night and, uh, and had a feast. Um, but yes, uh, Stephanie's right. You know, having, having just a little dose every now and then of something that you've grown yourself is very, 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 very nice. And it's good to see them growing. Uh, MDRS now does have a, um, a greenhouse. If you had one then, it wasn't operational where people uh, over the uh, field season do grow 
uh, grow um, vegetables and plants and so on uh, in an environmentally controlled greenhouse setting. All right, so um, there are no more questions. So I'm gonna ask if there are any more questions here, yeah, I'm Brew. Um, please put your questions in, but I'd like to ask our audience, if you know how to use the chat, please put in where the most remote place is that you've been. I think that'd be really interesting for us to see, you know, where do you think the most remote place is? And it doesn't necessarily have to be 50,000 kilometers away from, um, you know, Perth, but where remote, remote, isolated, that you felt most alone maybe, um, just pop some names down uh, where you've been or, or that you're proud of that you've been uh, and survived. I, I'd like to see some of those. I'd say probably the place I'm most happy about that I visited was Kirikara and it's the most remote Indigenous community in Australia and I was lucky enough to be flying there uh, just over a year ago. Um, real privilege to visit um, to visit that part of uh, remote Western Australia near the um, Lake Mackay on the Northern Territory border there. Uh, real privilege to meet those people and spend some time there. Antarctica, Joel's weather station. Mm, I've been there. Ah, oh, Canyonlands, Utah, nice. Yeah, Todd, on a cigar-shaped oceanography vessel in the, in the winter. Atlantic, mm, no movies. But at least you got a job, right? Simpson Desert is lovely, but yeah, three months is a long stint. Beaufort Sea and Arctic Ocean seismic survey, well done. iPad eight, not sure who you are, but well done. Uh, the Victoria Desert, beautiful, Leslie. Yep. Oh wow, top of Mount Luxmore in Fiordland, New Zealand. Nice, beautiful. Some really beautiful places. I think um, to David, David, we've got David Annette, who is the current president of the ACG online with us today. Uh, David, I think we need to um, do one of those uh, photo things, um, you know, send us photos of your most remote or isolated uh, field trip. That might be a, a theme some of us could send photos in for. Um, now, is, are there any more questions? And if there are, and you don't want to use chat, uh, the chat, um, function, please turn your microphone on and ask it verbally now. Is anybody interested in having a chat? Oh, Marley and uh, the Nuller Ball. Well done, Matt. And there's no forest at forest. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's a train station. And a, a Geoscience Australia Seismic Observatory. All right. Well, we're going to, I'm going to thank John and Steph again for their time and their amazing talks. Really enjoyed these. Um, they're phenomenal. The photography was fantastic, but your insights and your stories, really fantastic. I love a bit of uh, geology and uh, you know, that was just a bonus. I uh, really appreciate your help and time, especially given the short notice. To everybody who called in to spend the, the last hour or so with us, really appreciate your time. Great to see you, even if it was just for a, a little while or your name pop up. Take care, everybody. Um, I'm going to hang on line for a little bit longer. Feel free to unmute and put your video on and we can... Um, talk if you want to have a question it's not too late I'm going to hang on for another five or ten minutes thanks everybody